scanning for audio. Welcome to the second Dice Dad podcast. When I left last time, I was telling you about my history with role-playing. But now I had my quest. My quest was to run a game for my wife and my daughter. And let's face it, suddenly I realised, A, that I didn't really have enough spare time, and B, more importantly, that I was going to have to change things in order to make things accessible to a seven-year-old. And C, most importantly... I don't think I could really remember how to run Dungeons and Dragons. So after spending 10 quid on eBay, I managed to track myself down a copy of the original Red Box set. When it arrived in the post, I felt myself doing a little bit of a dance. Yes, I'd hit the internet and managed to find a few PDFs of some adventures and things, but there wasn't something like a YouTube guide to running a game. Perhaps I should get my bottom in gear and produce sort of thing. But, you know, Dungeons & Dragons has moved on. There's a fifth edition now. Arguably, the Red Box edition, the basic set, the one I'm talking about here, the one that from my childhood, is way out of date and shouldn't even be talked about. But I'm of a certain age and it's my show and I can do whatever I want. And trust me, I can do whatever I want. So yeah, it came with some very nice character sheets that you can photocopy. Thank God for home scanners and printers. And of course, there was the paraphernalia. This was my stroke of genius. A long time ago, I would get little lead figurines and paint them. That was the way of things of the time. You would use the figurines to represent yourself as, say, counters on a board. Of course, Dungeons & Dragons doesn't need any of this because the gameplay takes place in your imagination. But you'd be surprised how many people insist on having some sort of rudimentary map on the floor just so we can work out where people are standing while the monsters attack. Those things are time-consuming, and the fact that I am a highly trained... Not particularly great. Okay, I am reasonably good. All right, sorry for those Americans amongst us who don't take sarcasm or self-deprecating humour. I'm actually really good Uh, and quite highly trained model maker for film and television. I'm the person who gave Bob the Builder a sonic screwdriver, but let's leave that there. No, I was going to waste huge amounts of time producing intricate leg figurines for a game that perhaps my daughter and my wife might not even enjoy. This was going to be a problem. Then I realised something. I had Lego mini figures. Little knights, little witches, stuff that I'd given to my daughter, stuff that I'd admittedly bought for myself when I was far, far too old. But I refer you back to the I'm basically a geek thing. And then, while I was on eBay, I managed to track down a few, say, Lord of the Rings elves that I could change the heads around and make them female, because there had been requests for female characters, and that made so much more sense. Something that they could relate to. I asked my daughter what she wanted to be, and after some very, very curious answers, we narrowed it down to some sort of magic-using elf. Now, I knew from experience and fact that the rules of Dungeons & Dragons were not going to let me have a magic-using elf. They were going to let me have Elf, who's got a couple of spells. My wife also wanted to be an elf, but she wanted to be a fighter. Now, this was the point where I thought, I'm going to have to change things here. Now, admittedly, things like Dungeons & Dragons were always open for interpretation and bending of the rules. There isn't a single copy that I think I ever came across that didn't have pencils in the margin of people defining things. Think... Harry Potter's textbook in Half-Blood Prince. Little notes in the margin, marginalia, a word I absolutely adore, filling in things that actually help focus what's going on. So bending of the rules and moving things around wasn't going to be a problem. Working out the basic saving throws, which I'll explain later, was listed in the book. What's it going to be? There's a column, you write it down. Now a column for a fighter and a column for an elf are different, but race-wise these characters are going to be elves, so I'm going to have to write those down. So I worked it out from there. She's a magic user, she's going to have maybe one point more, so I looked at the magic user saving throws and the elf saving throws. I worked out a midpoint between the two and went with that. The only person that I had to justify it to was myself, and let's face it, it really wasn't going to be much of an argument. So I then moved on. The idea was to create wonderful, accessible characters that they could work with. 
So the creation of my brand new class, Fighter Elf and, or oh, Elf as it would be known in the rules, and Magic User Elf, i.e. an elf who was being trained up to become a magic user, so had their natural abilities and had some spells, seemed perfectly fine. They were always going to be first level because this was going to be an introductionary thing. I was no way I was going to give them the player's manual to work through, which gave me the bonus. I could run a variant on the solo adventure at the beginning of the basic set as their first adventure. That was my plan. I extended the map. I came up with a backstory and a possible plot. I knew I might have to have an NCP, that's a non-player character for anyone listening, who I would control in order to help them out. Also to provide them with cannon fodder and a character who could be killed off. A red shirt, perhaps in order to produce some sort of thing. So that was my plan. Read through the solo do-it-yourself adventure while I learned how to do the gaming system and then do the game. How do you play Dungeons & Dragons? I know that we sit around. I know that we have the dice. I had the dice. I had the Lego minifigures. Now, what I did was I made a tower of Lego bricks and I put the minifigures on top. I took my camera with the close-up lens, you know, with the setting on the top that lets you take photographs of flowers. I then went into my garden, held them in the air. There's a tree. So I held them up on a particularly blue, sunny day, got the out-of-focus trees in the background, and took a close-up photograph of the Lego figures. I'd augmented quite a few of them and produced some particularly lovely stuff. So we end up with outside photographs of Lego people standing near trees, You've got something that looks like it's from Lord of the Rings. My daughter's not going to be scared of the monsters because they're made of Lego. But they are just tokens to show us where we're standing when the rats come. And the monsters and the zombies and the ghosts and the vampires and all of those cool things like rust monsters and lurkers above. As I read through the monster manual section of the DM's book, my memories just came flooding back. Being attacked by lurkers above... Fending off things with fire. This could be great. And so I sat down every night to do the very boring bit of learning how the mechanics actually worked. And I'll talk more next time on Dice Dad. On the 3rd of September 2016, Hooverville 8 will be with us. Possibly the friendliest convention in the whole of the UK. This year's guests include, but are not limited to, Kai Owen from Torchwood. Michael Jason from Doctor Who, The Valiard himself, Katie Manning, Joe Grant, Eric Sayward, Sophie Aldred, good old ace, and Matthew Dale. For more information and to book your ticket, visit the Derby Quad website, www.derbyquad.co.uk. D E R B Y Q U A D.co.uk. That was the Doctor Who Tin Dog Podcast, available on iTunes, YouTube, Twitter, RSS, Vimeo, and across the internet. Doctor Who and its associated properties are all copyright and trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Why not become a supporter by visiting patreon.com slash tin dog? Contact the show on tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. <laughs>